This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. No ceasefire, no votes. And in November, we remember. Those were two chants we heard Saturday in Washington at the largest rally in U.S. history for Palestinian rights. Protesters denounced President Biden for refusing to support a ceasefire in Gaza while sending more arms to Israel as it continues its month-long bombardment that's killed over 10,000 Palestinians, including 4,000 children. Polls show Biden's support among Arab Americans is plummeting. This is Nahadawad, the head of CARE, that's the Council on American Islamic Relations, speaking at Saturday's rally. No ceasefire, no votes. No ceasefire, no votes. No votes in Michigan. No votes in Arizona. No votes in Georgia. No votes in Nevada. No votes in Wisconsin. No votes in Pennsylvania. No votes in Ohio. No votes for you anywhere. If you do not call for a ceasefire now, we will make our voices heard more and more. In November, we remember. In November, we remember. Nehadawad, uh, head of CARE, said he was speaking in his own capacity. We are joined now by Jim Zogby, president of the Arab American Institute, joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, it's great to have you with us. And if you can talk about these figures that I'm sure the White House is looking at carefully. In 2020, um, President Biden had something like 59 support of the Arab American community. Right now, it's at something like 17 percent. James Zogby, if you can talk about Biden's stance right now on Israel and Gaza. Thanks, Amy. Uh, it's been a long time since we've been together, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Um, look, the, yeah, the poll is one that we did um, to get a read on the community. Um, I have never seen in the 27 years we've been polling, my brother and I have been polling Arab Americans, we never saw a, a, a movement this dramatic over this short a period of time. The last time we polled uh, Arab Americans was just a few months ago, and the drop since then has been even more precipitous than the drop since 2020. Uh, this issue resonates. It's big. Uh, it's important. It also is part of a general national trend. Um, Arab Americans are not immune from the what the rest of the culture is feeling is, and that is that President Biden just is not in control of uh, his own presidency and how he is uh, being portrayed uh, to the American people and to the world. They didn't elect a Reaganite um, foreign policy uh, advocate, a, a neocon who was fighting for freedom there to have freedom here, that kind of rhetoric that comes from the White House. They voted for somebody that focused on a whole bunch of domestic issues to bring uh, domestic peace and tranquility after four years of Donald Trump. And that's not what they've gotten. And I, I, I think that, coupled with the Gaza situation, most certainly is driving these negative, these negative numbers. They are deeply disappointed with the position he's taken on this this conflict and uh and they they just uh, are are jumping ship. And Jim Zogby, could you talk about the um uh some other aspects of the poll uh, uh what the support for a ceasefire was and also whether there were uh gender or age or, or religious differences in in uh, those you polled? What was really significant was that uh, across the board, when you get numbers that high, uh, a flip that high or or numbers in the 70 percent range on several questions like support for a ceasefire or how important is the Palestinian issue to you or how disappointed are you with the president's performance on this issue, all of those numbers were two thirds or greater. When you get numbers that great, you expect across the board to see the cross tabs reading that way. And, and we did. Uh, there was virtually uh, no difference in terms of majorities, um, regardless of religion, regardless of, uh, of um, whether born here or immigrant um, or a gender or age, um, pretty much across the board. There's frustration and deep disappointment with this with this president. And um, uh, and and the question I keep getting asked is, 
Uh, can, can Biden win him back? Uh, the visceral reaction to this issue is so great that in order to do that, something dramatic has to come from the White House. And I'm not sure that the president has the wherewithal to do it. Look, I've heard two things from people at the White House. The one is uh, they're not going to vote for, for, for Donald Trump because they don't want to, uh, you know, they don't want back what he was doing uh, during his four years. And so they'll come around in a year. I, I told them that when I heard that, I said, that's insulting and dismissive. Um, uh, you have to earn that vote. They might just as well stay home. Uh, they might vote for for uh, Cornell West. They might they might just not vote at all. Uh, and and it's not a given that young Arab American women who want control over their bodies and their health care, that young or that older Arab Americans who want protection for their their you know Medicare or an expansion of health care, it's not clear that they're going to make the decision to vote at all if they don't have something to vote for. It worked the last time, vote for me because I'm not the other guy. I'm not quite sure it'll work, it'll work this time. And you know, I, I've got a an article coming out in the nation tomorrow that makes the point that it's not just Arab Americans who are affected this way. It's young people, it's progressive Jews, um, it's black, Latino, Asian voters. There's a significant decline that this president is encountering across the board. And, and you know, Gaza is playing into it. It is a, a sort of a canary in the coal mine issue. It's, a, uh, it's one that sort of is the the speaking to a broader sense of dissatisfaction and the white house has to get a handle on that and not not just dismiss it and speaking of broader sense of dissatisfaction you worked with bernie sanders for two of his campaigns uh, how do you understand his insistence only on calling for a humanitarian pause and not a ceasefire. And Juan, let me play a clip of Bernie Sanders uh, who was interviewed this weekend um, on CNN. I want to just clarify one thing, Senator, if I might. You support a humanitarian pause in Gaza. Some of your fellow progressives say that there should be a full-on ceasefire, which would require an agreement on both sides to halt the fighting. Do you support a ceasefire? And if not, why not? Well, I don't know how you can have a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, with an organization like Hamas, which is dedicated to turmoil and chaos and destroying the state of Israel. And I think what the Arab countries in the region understand, that Hamas has got to go. That was Bernie Sanders being interviewed by Dana Bash of CNN. Um, in fact, just a few days ago, uh, Bernie Sanders' office was occupied by a, uh, by a group of progressives uh, protesting that he wasn't calling for a ceasefire, among other senators, Jim Zogby. Look, you know, I— I have no idea. I've, I've, I've called the senator, uh, didn't get a call back, left them a couple of messages, text messages, didn't, didn't hear back. Um, and I'm disappointed and, and fr frankly confounded. I, I don't understand uh, the thinking here. Uh, one could easily take the sentence that he spoke about you don't have a ceasefire with a group like Hamas that blah, 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 and stick in the Netanyahu government uh, of the most extreme rightists uh, in the country uh, that are today, while under the cover of Gaza, uh, uh, taking uh, armed settlers uh, to evacuate Palestinian villages and force people uh, to leave their lands, leave their their uh, their their orchards and uh, uh, and their homes. Um, this is a crazy extremist government, and and yes, Hamas is uh, is a group that has done and does evil things, just like the Netanyahu government does evil things. The question is, that's why you need a ceasefire. Um, and to say we can't have peace with them, it's what the Palestinians say, we can't have peace with, with the Netanyahu government. But the problem is that the, the United States has to act like the adult in the room, and we haven't. We've been the cheerleader, the coat holder, the enabler, and the funder of one side, uh, digging the hole deeper every single day. And the result is, is that we're locked in a conflict here on Israel's side that has no good end in sight. Um, 
Those who think on this path will eliminate Hamas, forget what happened in Beirut in 82, forget what happened in Lebanon in 2006, or what happened in Afghanistan or Iraq. You don't eliminate. What you do is you create the conditions for something more virulent afterwards. You're not going to get rid of Hamas. I mean, the, the, the million plus people who've been forced to leave their belongings, their memories, the neighborhoods that they lived in, now reduced to rubble and flee to the south where there's no infrastructure to take care of them. The families of the 10,000 who've died, 4,000 of whom children, they're not going to say when this is over, if it's ever over, oh, we love Israel, let's have peace. There is going to be the seed, there are the seeds being planted today um, for Hamas 2.0 or something more virulent. And and I don't understand how the the folks in the White House or the State Department just don't get it and say, this is not going to end well. At the end of this path, with the exception of more dead bodies, more anger, and more virulent extremism, we're going to be right back where we started. Uh, I, it's a failure of the United States, not of Hamas and, and of Israel, but the United States. We have not shown the leadership um, that we ought to be showing, given the fact that we're funding this damn thing, uh, to stop it. And James Ogden, you've been for decades now an expert in uh, in public opinion and polling, and it's not just uh, the United States or, uh, or England and France where we're seeing unprecedented uh, demonstrations in support of the uh, the Palestinians and uh, opposed to Israeli bombardment and, and the invasion, but also across the global south, you, uh, in, in the rest of the world, uh, outside of the Western countries. There's virtually uh, no support uh, for the United States uh, uh, policies and, and Israel. I'm wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, and we've just finished a poll in 12 Arab countries. I should add, my brother does the domestic polling. Uh, we played the game of risk, and, and he took one side of the board, and I got the other side of the board. I do polling in the Middle East and, and some polling in Europe. Uh, we've done some polling on Ukraine and with European countries, uh, their attitude toward it. But in the Arab world, um, uh, we— We've blown it. Uh, there wasn't actually much of a bounce when Joe Biden got elected. The damage done by George W. Bush, um, the disappointment in Obama making promises in Cairo that excited people and then blaming the Arabs for not delivering on the promises he made, um, and then Trump and the the, the chaos of four years. Uh, people have told me there, uh, we've been on a roller coaster with your country for the last 20 years, and frankly, we're dizzy right now. We don't know what we're getting. Um, they, they too, hope for calm when Joe Biden got elected. And instead of calm, they have two big wars, uh, and they're being forced to choose. And frankly, they can't because they have decided, uh, as European countries are deciding, um, that they have to make their own decisions, and they have to do what's in their interest. And their people are watching what is happening in Gaza and saying, hell no, we're not going to do this anymore. Even countries that have made peace with Israel, uh, their public opinion has turned decidedly against uh, Israel and decidedly against uh, the prospect of living in harmony with that country. Damage has been done here. And I don't understand in all of my conversations with people at the White House and the State Department that they don't just get it. I, I, don't, I don't know what they're taking in the morning that makes them think today is going to be a better day. Israel's going to kill more people and ever Arabs are going to say, let's have peace with Israel. That it doesn't work that way. And I, I've been down this road now for the last 40, 50 years doing this work full time. And frankly, it gets worse, not better. And those who think you you win a victory in a war where you kill lots of civilians, um, their heads aren't screwed on right. And frankly, um, we, we need new thinking on this, but the guys in the White House uh, aren't capable, I think, of that kind of new thinking. And it's really, it's deeply disturbing because the hole we're digging is one it's going to take a generation to get out of. Jim Zogby, I wanted to ask you a few quick questions. I see you have a TV behind you, and I was looking to see if there was a crack in the screen, uh, because I was wondering of your, co your comments on the coverage by the mainstream media, a word you almost never hear. And I'm not talking about Fox. I'm talking about MSNBC and CNN, places where you appear. Um, rarely do we hear the word occupation. 
Mm -hmm. And why that is so significant in understanding how to end this. We're not just talking about Gaza. We're talking about the West Bank. Um, when you had the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, saying uh, right before October 7th, you know, it's peaceful there in the Middle East. We're moving on to other issues. Yet, at that time, you had at least a Palestinian a day being killed in the West Bank by settlers or by the Israeli military. Now, I think, since October 7th, the number is well over 150. Um, the OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Gaza and the West Bank. Um, question how we should be talking about this issue, what you think would be the most honest. And do you think there's a difference between Biden and Trump, not on other domestic issues, but on Israel-Palestine? Joe Biden promised us a lot. Uh, he issued not just a platform plank the, the, that was one that they made some accommodations uh, to us about, but uh, they issued a separate policy statement for Arab Americans. And um, and I remember when we wanted language that talked about the equality of, of human needs and rights, and they issued that statement uh, that both Israelis and Palestinians are equally deserving of, and then there were a litany of words that followed it. Uh, three, three and a half years later, we're still waiting for the delivery on the equal promise of. Uh, all the Palestinians have gotten has been a green light for Israel to run roughshod over the West Bank, uh, take more land, build more settlements, demolish more homes, more restrictions on Palestinian rights, uh, Jerusalem the same, and Gaza worse. Um, it's been a huge disappointment. And um, uh, and frankly, I, I don't... Um, I recall some interesting things in the platform debate that I, that still troubled me because I remember back in '88 when I was negotiating with with Madeleine Albright uh, on the the Dukakis Jackson platform issue. We wanted the word Palestinian in the platform, and the, uh, she told me she said if the P word even appears um, in print uh, in the Democratic Party platform, all hell will break loose. I told her I said don't play chicken little with me. The sky's not going to fall. We can do it and get it and 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 live with it. I mean it's 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 not rocket science to say there are Palestinians in this conflict. The party had never even mentioned the word up till then, and it didn't that year either. Uh, what troubled me in 2016 and 2020 um, was that we couldn't get the word occupation in the platform. They wouldn't use the word occupation, which was Trump language. Trump wouldn't use occupation either. In fact, they changed the human rights report from reporting on the occupied territories to putting it all in one in one thing. That was uh, uh, that was the the, the green uh, the what do you call it the uh, U.S. ambassador Friedman uh, Trump's ambassador wanted it that way. There was no occupation. The Biden administration deals with it as if it were an occupation. Uh, in in language, but not in practice, not in practice. We have not put conditions or terms on Israel to deal with Palestinians as an occupied people. Um, and so um, we've kind of come a ways, but we haven't come anywhere at all. From not using the P word to not using the occupation word, um, frankly, it's a maybe a little a bit of a semantic thing, but Palestinians are living under a brutal occupation. It's an apartheid occupation. Um, and they are also being victims of a genocidal attack on Gaza right now that is killing the infrastructure, killing the people, forcibly evicting over a million people from their homes in the north to move south, where there is no capacity to care for them. They're living in tents without water, without power, without health care. The hospitals in the south are not capable of dealing with all the issues um, and the Israelis are treating the people in the north as if, as the general says, they're all animals and deserve to die. Um, if that's not genocide, I don't know what is. And yet this administration, if they can't use the word occupation, and for God's sake, they won't use the word apartheid, they can't use the word genocide. Something horrible is happening to these people. And this administration is turning a blind eye to it. And I'm sorry, but when they say we're deeply concerned, if that's the best they can do, when we're providing 14.3 billion additional this year on top of 4 billion, when we're providing diplomatic cover at the United Nations, that is not enough. And frankly, this, what is happening in Gaza is not only happening on our watch, but we're complicit and enabling it. Sounds harsh, but it's the reality and they have to deal with it. And there are gonna be electoral consequences. And I, I wish it weren't so. 
Last thing on earth I want to see is a Republican of the type of Donald Trump or whoever comes after in the White House. But they have to earn the vote and establish that there's a difference. They haven't done it. James Zogby, president of the Arab American Institute, joining us from Washington, D.C. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.